Hey, faithful listener, welcome to season six of the Bible Explained podcast, the podcast where the Bible gets explained. So grab your cup of coffee and enjoy today's discussion from the book of Joshua. Happy 4th of July weekend, everybody. This is Jen with the Bible Explained podcast. And I hope the weather has just been fantastic for you guys. We've had some humid, hot days, which are amazing. Oh my goodness, I love them. Because we have had such a long winter, it feels like. And finally, we're getting to some warmer days in July, which is great. So so this is the first week I kind of felt like it got hot, if that makes sense where I live. But let me know what the weather is in your area and tell me what you're doing for the 4th of July tomorrow. And don't forget that I will not be doing an episode tomorrow. I'm going to be taking the 4th of July off to just relax and celebrate. Hopefully the weather is really sunny. But I'll be back on Wednesday with another episode out of Joshua. And then Thursday will be our regular New Testament episode. But tomorrow I am not going to be doing one. And I hope all of you enjoy your time off as well. For those of you who live in the United States anyway. Okay, let's read Joshua chapter 16, actually. I'm going to be reading two chapters this morning. I'm going to be reading actually all of Joshua 16 and all of Joshua 17. Now, don't worry. Joshua 16 is only 10 verses long. And then Joshua 17 is 18 verses long. So it's not super duper long. It's actually about the the norm of what I read. So I'm pairing these two together because they actually flow very well into each other. They're both talking about the tribe of Manasseh and actually a sin that the tribe of Manasseh ends up committing. So we're going to talk about this today. So please turn in your Bibles with me to Joshua chapter 16. We'll start there and we'll move into Joshua 17 as well. I'll be reading out of W.E.B. The lots came out for the children of Joseph from the Jordan at Jericho, at the waters of Jericho on the east, even the wilderness, going up from Jericho through the hill country to Bethel. It went out from Bethel to Luz, and passed along the border of the Archites to Atarath. And it went down westward to the border of the Japhelites, to the border of Beth Horon the lower, and on the Gazer, and ended at the sea. The children of Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim took their inheritance. This was the border of the children of Ephraim according to their families. The border of their inheritance eastward was Atrath Ador to Beth Horon the upper. The border went out westward to Mikmatha on the north. The border turned about eastward to Tanath Shiloh and passed along it on the east of Genoa. It went down from Genoa to Atarath to Nara, reached to Jericho, and went out at the Jordan. From Tapua, the border went along westward to the brook of Cana and ended at the sea. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Ephraim, according to their families, together with the cities which were set apart for the children of Ephraim, in the middle of the inheritance of the children of Manasseh, all the cities with their villages. They didn't drive out the Canaanites, who lived in Gezer. But the Canaanites dwell in the territory of Ephraim to this day, and have become servants to do forced labor. This was the lot for the tribe of Manasseh, for he was firstborn of Joseph. As for Machir, the firstborn of Manasseh, the father of Gilead, because he was a man of war, Therefore, he had Gilead and Bashan. This was for the rest of the children of Manasseh, according to their families. For the children of Abizer, Halak, Asriel, Shechem, Hefer, and for the children of Shemitah. These were the male children of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, according to their families. But Salophahad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, had no sons but daughters. These are the names of his daughters, Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Terza. They came to Eleazar the priest, and to Joshua the son of Nun, and to the princes, saying, Yahweh commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brothers. Therefore, according to the commandment of Yahweh, he gave them an inheritance among the brothers of their father. Ten parts fell to Manasseh, in addition to the land of Gilead and Bashan, which is beyond the Jordan, because the daughters of Manasseh had an inheritance among his sons. The land of Gilead belonged to the rest of the sons of Manasseh. The border of Manasseh was from Asher to Mikmatha, which is before Shechem. The border went along to the right hand to the inhabitants of En Tapua. The land of Tapua belonged to Manasseh, but Tapua on the border of Manasseh belonged to the children of Ephraim. The border went down to the brook of Cana, southward of the brook. These cities belonged to Ephraim among the cities of Manasseh. The border of Manasseh was on the north side of the brook and ended at the sea. Southward it was Ephraim's, and northward it was Manasseh's, and the sea was his border. 
They reached to Asher on the north and to Issachar on the east. Manasseh had three heights in Issachar, in Asher, Beth, Shane, and its towns, and Ilbium and its towns, and the inhabitants of Dor and its towns, and the inhabitants of Endor and its towns, and the inhabitants of Tanakh and its towns, and the inhabitants of Megiddo and its towns. Yet the children of Manasseh couldn't drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. When the children of Israel had grown strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor and didn't utterly drive them out. The children of Joseph spoke to Joshua saying, why have you given me just one lot and one part for an inheritance since we are a numerous people because Yahweh has blessed us so far? Joshua said to them, if you are a numerous people, go up to the forest and clear land for yourselves there in the land of the Perizzites and of the Rephium, since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. The children of Joseph said, the hill country is not enough for us. All the Canaanites who dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both those who are in Beth Shane and its towns and those who are in the valley of Jezreel. Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph, that is to Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, you are a numerous people. You have great power. You shall not have one lot only, but the hill country shall be yours. Although it is a forest, you shall cut it down, and its farthest extent shall be yours. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots of iron, and though they are strong. This one for me was really fun to read. I, I just enjoy the challenge of some of these names. <laughs> Not always, but today I kind of did. And it talks about the borders of Manasseh as well as Ephraim. And Manasseh and Ephraim together, they were considered to be the tribe of Joseph. They were two half tribes, if that makes sense. However, together, they made the, the largest tribe actually technically even larger than Judah. And Judah was considered to be the largest tribe. But Manasseh and Ephraim together were bigger than Judah, but they were half tribes. So that's why they're not considered to be the biggest tribe, if that makes sense. But they were, in fact, bigger than Judah. And so it talks about the border of Manasseh and Ephraim in Joshua 16. And Joshua 16 is almost like an overview <laughs> of the next chapter. It almost describes what's going to happen in Joshua 17. So that's why I wanted to pair them together and read them both together. But I want to focus mostly on Joshua 17 today. And so the first part of Joshua 17 in verses 1 through 12 talks about all the borders of both Ephraim and Manasseh. And so I have my little map again, and I'm actually going to link this map in the description so you guys can take a look at it too if you would like to, because when you're looking at a map, it just makes a lot more sense. You can just see uh, the borders and how it was drawn out, and it even has like all the little towns here. And so it's just really cool if you want to get into like the history of Manasseh and Ephraim and their borders. Now, one of the reasons this is in scripture is to show that these were real places at a real time. It's a history lesson of all these different areas of land, of all these different cities that existed. Some of them still do exist, like uh, Jerusalem, for example. And so it's just kind of cool to see the, the different towns. But Manasseh had a huge piece of land because if you'll remember, Manasseh was split up again, even though it was a half tribe. Half of them wanted to stay beyond the Jordan River, which means on the other side of the Jordan River, where the promised land technically wasn't at. And then the other half of Manasseh wanted to stay in the promised land on the other side of the Jordan River, where the promised land technically was. So we're focusing mainly on the tribe of Manasseh that wanted to stay in the promised land. We kind of already talked about the other part of Manasseh that was on the other side. But it's kind of cool how it works out if you're looking at the map, because both Manasseh on the other side of the Jordan in the not promised land and the Manasseh on the promised land side, they connect. And then the, the river just splits right down the middle of it. But anyway, Manasseh had a good chunk of land here and it extended all the way to the Mediterranean Sea and Ephraim was right underneath Manasseh. So the two tribes touched each other, but Ephraim did not extend to the sea. It had a smaller hunk of land than Manasseh did. 
but they they did border each other. And that's kind of like laid out right here that Manasseh and Ephraim had like shared cities is kind of what it looks like here. Oh, yeah. The border went down to the brook of Cana. Southward of the brook, the cities belong to Ephraim along the cities of Manasseh. Then it says southward, it was Ephraim's and northward, it was Manasseh's. The sea was his border. So, yeah, it was just they shared a lot of stuff, basically. But right in the middle of this breaking up of the land, it mentions these five daughters again. And if you guys remember who these five daughters were, they've already been mentioned multiple times in scripture. These five daughters were the daughters of Zelophehad. And Zelophehad had been a man that died in the wilderness, but he had no sons. And so these five daughters actually go and talk to Moses. And they're just like, look, just because we aren't sons, why shouldn't we get land? And so Moses talked to God about it because this was unheard of for women to like own land back in this time period. Unheard of. So Moses talks to God and God's like, they are right. They should get part of the land. And so Moses did allow them to have land. And so now they come up here again. The five daughters uh, came to Eliezer, the priest, and to Joshua. And they say, Yahweh commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brothers. And so they remind Joshua when he's splitting up the land. These five daughters go to Joshua and they're like, look, we we are owed part of this land. And so Joshua, in fact, gives them the land they got an inheritance among the brothers of their father. So that's what happened there. It's finally divvied up. They finally get their inheritance. And I think this is the last we're going to hear of these five daughters. They finally get the inheritance they were entitled to. But the one verse here at the very bottom, it talks about how there were still Canaanites living in the land. So after the land was like portioned out, it kind of sounds like each tribe would go and fight for their own land, if that makes sense. And they would all like do it together. So the children of Manasseh, when they go into the land that was allotted to them, it says they couldn't drive out some of the Canaanites, some of the Canaanites that lived in certain cities. It says the Canaanites would dwell in that land. And actually in chapter 16, it actually mentions that Ephraim also couldn't drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So they made them become forced servants, basically. And it looks like Manasseh did the exact same thing in Joshua 17, verse 13. When the children of Israel had grown strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor and didn't utterly drive them out. So this is a sin. This was a complete and total sin, not just because of the forced labor thing, but because God's order was for the Israelites to totally drive out all of the Canaanites from that region. That land no longer belongs to the Canaanites. God was giving it to the Israelites and God can do whatever he wants with the land that he made. I mean, he made the earth. He can divvy it up however he wants. And so it was time for the Canaanites to get out of there because they were godless people. They were idolaters. They did all sorts of crazy things. They had like child uh, sacrifices and human sacrifices. God wanted them out and he wanted all of their idolatry out with them. In fact, God even said, when you drive the Canaanites out, you're going to also destroy basically all their pagan idols as well. So Manasseh and Ephraim both didn't drive out the Canaanites. At first, Manasseh couldn't do it, is what it says. Manasseh couldn't drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. So what happened there? Because God said that he was going to help all the people drive out the Canaanites. So why all of a sudden is Manasseh unable to drive out the Canaanites? I think it was because, first and foremost, they lost faith in God. God was helping them. But if the Manassites just absolutely choose to not do it, that's free will. And the Manassites can do that, though they would be disobeying God. And that's not good. But that was the Manassites choice. They could choose to not drive these people out. And Ephraim kind of did the same thing in Joshua 16. They both chose to put the Canaanites to forced labor instead. That's what it says. When the children of Israel had grown strong, 
They put the Canaanites to force to labor and didn't utterly drive them out. So they were strong. It's very clear here that they were, in fact, strong enough to do it. But instead of following what God wanted them to do and driving all the Canaanites out, the Manassites and the Ephri- Ephraimites, <laughs> Ephraimites, the tribe of Ephraim, there we go, they chose instead to have slaves. They wanted the forced labor. They were greedy, and that's what they wanted. And look what ends up happening. Both tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, come up to Joshua and yell at him. Why have you given us just one lot and one part for an inheritance since we are a numerous people because Yahweh has blessed us so far? And you can see that Joshua gets pretty irritated at them. He gets really irritated at them. He's like, if you are a numerous people, then go up to the forest, clear the land and take it for yourself. There's uh, the Rephium living there. There's the Parasites living there. Drive them out and take that hill country. These two tribes didn't want to do the work. They got comfy. They got complacent. They got happy with their slave labor. That's what they wanted. They didn't want to drive these people out because they got greedy. And this is a sin Israel fell into multiple times. And that's why God said, totally drive them out. Do it. Do not make peace treaties with them. Do not uh, have them in the land with you. Drive them out. And yet the, these two tribes didn't listen to God's voice because they didn't drive the people of Canaan all the way out. Their gods were still around. And so the Canaanites, as they were living among the Israelites, even if they were doing forced labor, they were living among the Israelites and still worshiping their very own gods. And the Israelites would be influenced by that. The Israelites were very easily influenced by other people. And that's why God was so strict with the Israelites in some ways, I think. I mean, we're all very easily influenced. We're all like sheep without a shepherd. That's what Jesus called us until he was our good shepherd. But we're all like sheep. We've all gone astray. We're all very easily influenced. And so that's why God was very strict about this rule. Do not have the Canaanites in your region because they're going to cause you to fall away. And that's what ended up happening, of course, to Israel. We'll talk about that more in the book of Judges. But now Manasseh and Ephraim are angry and they feel entitled to even more land when they haven't even cleared out the land that they already have. They feel entitled to even more land. And so they want an easy way out. They want Joshua to just be like, oh, okay, well, you can take this land over here. You know, you need more land. You're absolutely right. You need to take it. But Joshua is like, no, if you want land, go get it for yourself. If you want land, drive out the parasites and the Rephium. And don't forget the Rephium were like the giant people. And take the hill country for yourselves. And then they're still mad. They say, the hill country is not enough for us. All the Canaanites who dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron. Both of those who are in Beth Sheen and its towns and all those who are in the valley of Jezreel. So they're scared. That's the main problem here is these two tribes are scared. They're scared of going into battle. They want the easy way out. They just want to look peaceful and reap all the benefits of their forced labor and, you know, do whatever they want to do. And that's how human beings are all the time. We just want to do whatever we think is good, but it ends up biting us in the end. Because if it's anti-God, God God sees the full picture, right? And he knows exactly what we're supposed to be doing in order to achieve the best results. And if something we want to do is anti-God, It's going to be terrible for us in the long run because we're doing our very own thing and we're not listening to God who knows the entire full picture. And that's exactly what Manasseh and Ephraim are doing here. And so they're arguing with with Joshua. Joshua is like, well, you didn't do what you were supposed to do. So go do what you're supposed to do and take more land. And so they're just like, well, we're scared. They have so many, you know, uh, chariots of iron And they have, you know, weapons and stuff. And so Joshua says to them, you are a numerous people. You just said it yourself. You have great power. You just said it yourself. And that's what they they literally did. They said to Joshua right before this, 
You have given us just one lot. We are a numerous people. We have been blessed by Yahweh. And so Joshua reminds them of what they've just said. He's like, well, you are numerous. You have been blessed by Yahweh. So what's the hold up here? What's what's going on with you guys? And that's kind of how it ends. He says, the hill country shall be yours. He says, God is going to help you. Just go do it. Just go do it. And that's the thing with us. God does expect an amount of work, I believe, from each of us. He expects all of us to carry our own burdens. That's a verse in scripture. And also to help other people while we're carrying our own burdens. But we're supposed to be doing work. There's another verse that talks about how those who will not work shall not eat. And it's very funny because I just did a blog post about that very verse. I talked about laziness actually on the blog. So if you're interested in that blog post, go over and check that out because I I talked about all different forms of laziness, like procrastination and um, sleeping too much and just all the problems I struggle with. Basically, I talked about in a blog post for you guys to um, read about my dirty laundry. But anyway, (laughs) anyway, it's important for us to to do work. God created Adam at the very beginning to work. That was like his very first thing God created him to do was work the garden. So God creates us to work and he creates us to do things. And yes, God will help us with that work. But if we just sit back and do absolutely nothing, God's not going to help us. And so we have to do the work. We have to put the work forward. And that's what Joshua is telling the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. He's saying, look, go do the work and you're going to be blessed. You're going to see God working with you. And I think God, he gets too much of a bad rap sometimes. But maybe it's us. Maybe sometimes we get in the way of God working. There was an excellent prayer I heard somebody pray um, about a year ago. I was at like a, a little show thing. And the guy got up on the stage and he was praying this prayer. And he said, he said, Holy Spirit, we invite you in. I pray that... I do not get in the way of you working. Get me out of your way and just work in spite of me. And I was like, wow, that's a really cool and very humble prayer and a really humble way to look at it. Sometimes we are the ones getting in the way of our own success. Sometimes we are the ones who are getting in the way of God really working. And God has to like work around us and he will. God will work around us because he can and he's almighty and he works in spite of us. But wouldn't it just be easier to just surrender to God's will and to just get out of God's way and just do what God wants us to do? It'd be so much easier. And we'd be saving ourselves so much heartache if we just did what God asked us to do. So my challenge is, what is God asking you to do that you might be getting in the way of? And if you can't think of anything, then maybe pray that prayer for the future. And just say, God, work in spite of me and get me out of your way. And just help me to do what you want me to do. And that's what Manasseh and Ephraim here had to do. They couldn't be afraid. They couldn't want complacency. They just had to go do it. And that was how they were truly going to be blessed by God. This was a really long episode, but I really enjoyed talking about this. I I think maybe you guys could hear the passion (laughs) <laughs> for my t- uh, this topic. And it's so funny that I just talked about this on the blog. And what's so cool is that sometimes whenever a blog post goes up, it just seems like there's a theme, you know, f- for the entire week for that blog post. It's almost like uh it's almost like God is talking to me. Maybe it's maybe it's me. I have to <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed everything today. And if you did, please share the podcast. Please tell people that it exists and let everybody know that the Bible Explained podcast is out there. And I am so appreciative of all of your guys' uh, wonderful reviews and comments. But don't forget, tomorrow I am taking a day off from the podcast. But you know what? My Out of the Mire devotional is now on version. So if you type in Out of the Mire or if you look in the description 
down below, you're going to find the Out of the Mire devotional on version. I will link it for you. Go over to the devotional on version called Out of the Mire, Trusting in God in the Middle of Trials. Friends and faith listeners, have a wonderful 4th of July day. I will see you all on Wednesday. Happy listening and God bless. <laughs>